praise God. We're so glad you're with us tonight. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Judges tonight. Those of you that are joining us online, we welcome you in the name of the Lord. Praise God. And Father, we thank you tonight that as we go to your word, Lord, that as we allow the Holy Spirit to instruct us and teach us, that, Lord, your word makes a difference and a change in our life. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God that is living and active. Your word said it is sharper than a two-edged sword, and it pierces the soul, the spirit, the joints, and the marrow. And we thank you today, Lord, for all that you're doing and all that you will do. And we give you all the glory. May Jesus be glorified tonight, Lord, in our lives and through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Um, you know, there was a, a famous song that was sung, some of you probably have heard it. Some of you probably don't if you're too, if you're too young. Uh, it was a, a, a song that was made famous actually by Fred Astaire uh, and Ginger Rogers, and they actually danced to this song. It was called, let's call the whole thing off. It was written by George uh, Gershwin, I believe it was. Anyway, uh, and it's all about the different ways that people speak. You might remember part of the line is, you like potato, I like potato, you like tomato, I like tomato. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato. Let's call the whole thing off. And that was the whole gist of the song. Uh, here in Judges chapter 12, I want to begin reading here. And the reason I mention that is because we're going to find here a, a word that's actually brought into the English language and the, the English-speaking world was borrowed actually from this chapter in the Bible. Uh, it's the word shibboleth. Some of you probably never heard of it, <clears throat> but in the modern context, a shibboleth is a word or a manner of speaking or a behavior that shows that someone is a part of a particular group. Uh, for instance, if you heard people say, uh, let's take the uh, car and, or the automobile and, and go get some petrol, well, you, that kind of sounds strange to you, but that's a, a shibboleth, and it identifies and points to the uh, British influence on someone, because we don't say petrol, we say gasoline, right? Uh, but that word shibboleth is kind of a really um, different type of, of word, but we find it here in Judges chapter 12, and I, wanna, I want us to read here from beginning at verse 1 of Judges chapter 12, verse 1. It says, then the men of Ephraim gathered together, crossed over toward Saphon, and said to Jephthah, why did you cross over to fight against the people of Ammon and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house down on you with fire. Now, the men or the tribe of Ephraim was one of the tribes in Israel, and Jephthah was one of the judges that God had raised up. You remember Samson was the judge, Gideon was the judge. Well, Jephthah was one of the judges that uh, served uh, Israel during this period of the judges. And uh, he is confronted by the men of Ephraim because Jephthah had gone to war uh, against the Ammonites and had defeated them. And so they came and they were very upset at him. And there's a reason really why this attitude is taken by the men of Ephraim. And that's kind of what we want to talk a little bit about tonight. But they actually said, we're going to burn your house down. They were very uh, upset at Jephthah for what he had done, or actually not done. He had not uh, called on them, according to them, to fight in this battle. They wanted to uh, have, be able to uh, enjoy the victory, even though they kind of didn't make the risks that were necessary that Jephthah did in the army. But in verse 2, it says that Jephthah said to them, My people and I were in a great struggle with the people of Ammon, and when I called you, you did not deliver me out of their hands. So when I saw that you would not deliver me, in other words, you wouldn't come to help, I took my life in my hands and I crossed over against the people of Ammon and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Now Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim. And the men of Gilead defeated Ephraim because they said, You Gideonites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. And the Gileadites seized the fords of the Jordan before the Ephraimites arrived. 
And when any Ephraimite who escaped said, let me cross over, the men of Gilead would say to him, are you an Ephraimite? And he said, no. Then they would say to him, then say Shibboleth. And he would say Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. Then they would take him and kill him at the fords of the Jordan. There fell at that time 42,000 Ephraimites. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the, Gilead, the Gileadite died and was buried among the cities of Gilead. Now, in, in Jephthah's time, uh, we read here that uh, the way that Shibboleth was pronounced actually made a distinction, allowed them to know if they were really from the, the tribe of Manasseh or they, ha, or any, or they were uh, of the tribe of Ephraim. And so it's very interesting that whenever they uh, fought against the men of Ephraim, Jephthah did, because they came and, and they had threatened him and they came against him, he defeated the Ephra Ephraimites. And uh, the way that after the battle, of course, they went and they took a certain area. And in order for the uh, Ephraimites to be able to get back to their locality, they had to pass through there. And so it says that they took control of this area, uh, the fords of the Jordan, he said. And so when the people that had survived the war, they tried to go through there, uh, they would ask him this peculiar request. Uh, are you an Ephraimite? Because remember, they were the enemy at that time. And they said, no. How would they find out if they were? Well, say Shibboleth. <laughs> and of course, they, they said Sibboleth. They couldn't pronounce the word the way uh, this particular group of of, of, from Manasseh could. And so that's how they found out that they were part of the enemy. They were trying to sneak back into their own territory. It's kind of an interesting uh, story. You probably uh, maybe have read it, maybe you haven't. But this, this word, uh, again, made the distinction between these two groups of people. And as a result of that, there was uh, 42 thousand Ephraimites, it says, who really died in that battle or died as a result of that. There's a lot of casualties that came as a result of that. In Hebrews 11, hold your place here in Judges, but in Hebrews 11, verse 33 and 34, we read about the men of faith. And it says in Hebrews 11, verse 34, that there were these men of faith, it says, uh, let's go to verse 33, I'm sorry. Verse 33, they, who through faith, he says, they subdued kingdoms, they worked righteousness, they obtained promises, they stopped the mouth of lions, verse 34, and quenched the violence of fire, they escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, they became valiant in battle, they turned to flight the armies of the aliens. And it's describing the men of faith. Well, if you go back to verse 32, one of those men of faith mentioned here in Hebrews 11 in the hall of faith is Jephthah. It says, uh, the writer says, and what more shall I say for the time would fail me to tell you of Gideon. Gideon again was one of the judges in Israel, and Barak and Samson as well, and Jephthah. And he's mentioned here as a man of faith, as a man who God used and anointed to deliver the children of Israel. He was uh, a little bit of his, of his background. He, go back to Judges uh, chapter 11. He was actually an unwanted brother. He was born, the scripture tells us in Judges 11.1. 1. He was a mighty man of valor. He was a Gileadite, but he was the son of a harlot. In other words, he had been born as a result of an, a, a, uh, uh, an immoral act or an affair that his father had had uh, with a harlot. But uh, uh, Gilead, it says, begot Jephthah. In other words, that uh, the wife of his father took him in. But Gilead's wife bore sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said, you shall have no inheritance in our father's house for you are the son of another woman. So even though he was born from, with this background, his mother was a harlot, uh, it's interesting that he appears in the hall of faith because it doesn't matter what your background is, you can still be a person that God can use and be a person of faith. Aren't you glad for that? Because sometimes we think, well, you know, I wasn't born with the best pedigree. Well, neither was Jephthah. 
And his brothers didn't want to have anything to do with him. When his father died, they basically threw him out. They, uh, you know, told him, you, you, you have another mother. We don't want you around. And so Jephthah had to flee. He had to leave his home. And he went and moved to another place. Well, with time, Israel was being uh, attacked by the Ammonites and these different groups uh, that were there uh, in the land. And so they came looking for Jephthah, that is Israel. They came hunting because they wanted him to be, they knew he was a man of valor. They knew he was a man uh, uh, who was a warrior. And so being in a situation of war, they, they say, you know, we need somebody that can actually stand up against these people and go, you know, and lead the people. And so they went looking for him and they found him uh, in, in, 11, in Judges 11 there, chapter 11, verse 7. It says that Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and expel me from my father's house? Why have you now come to me now when you are in distress? And so uh, to make the long story short, Jephthah ends up agreeing that he will go and lead the army against the Ammonites. But he made a request. He said, now, if the Lord gives me victory, will you make me the head? Will you make me the head of the army? Will you make me the head uh, 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 before the army of the people? And they, they agreed. They said yes. And so the Lord gave Jephthah victory over the Ammonites. And it's interesting because as you read the story of Jephthah, you find that he was one of the judges appointed, as I said, by the Lord. But he was a warrior, and he was an undefeated warrior. That is, he never lost any of the battles that he went into. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit, just like the other judges were. You remember the Bible says that the, the Spirit of God would come upon Samson uh, at seasons and at times. Well, the same thing came uh, over Jephthah in verse 32 of the 11th chapter there. We read that Jephthah advanced toward the people of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. Verse 33, and he defeated them from Aror as far as Meneth, 20 cities, and to Abel Karamin with a very great slaughter. Thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And so Jephthah advances against the Ammonites, and he takes basically 20 of their cities, 20 of their strongholds, and totally defeats the Ammonites because the Lord was with him. Now, the leaders, go back to chapter 12, verse uh, 1. The leaders of Ephraim, or the men of Ephraim, came, as I said, and they were very upset that he had gone out to war without taking them into account. Um, they uh, expressed anger, so much anger that, as we read earlier, they wanted to burn down his house. They were threatening him. Of course, if you, if you read through this, the, the Judges, you find out in, in Judges chapter 8, verse 1, that the Ephraimites did the same thing with Gideon. Gideon was, again, one of the judges of Israel, one of the leaders that God had anointed. They went to him and said, and of course, at that time, it wasn't against the Ammonites. In chapter 8 and verse 1, it actually was, I believe it was against the uh, the. Um, The Midianites. He had gone against the Midianites. And so they went to him and say, you know, why didn't you uh, uh, call us for the fight? And, of course, uh, Gideon was a little bit more uh, diplomatic in his response to Jephthah. Uh, I mean, to, uh, uh, to uh, the Ephraimites. But uh, when they came to Jephthah, he said to them, well, I called you, but you didn't come. I called you. I wanted you to come. But when you didn't come, he said, I had to risk my own life and the, the people that were with me. And we went out and we got victory. And the Lord gave us victory. And so the Ephraimites, we, we see, had a pattern. They had gone several times to one to Gideon, once to Gideon, another to Jephthah. You know, it's like the people, you know, that come in after everything's already done and all the victories accomplished. Say, Here we are. Why didn't you call us? It's like, hey. You were, you were, you were uh, notified. You just didn't come. And so they uh, were, as I said, very threatening towards Jephthah at this time. They were very angry with him. Now, as you read through the story, the Ephraimites' anger wasn't impulsive. In other words, they didn't just get anger beca angry because of that situation. It was actually an anger that was generational. There was a resentment in the 
tribe of Ephraim. Now, Gilead, where Jephthah was from, that was kind of his home turf. And just kind of give you a little background so you can understand the story here. Gilead was part of the territory that belonged to the half-tribe of Manasseh. Now, if you ever studied the Old Testament, you find that God had 12 tribes, right? Well, one of those tribes was composed of two different heads, Ephraim and Manasseh. And they had actually taken over the, uh, the tribe, the tribal recognition, I should say, within the, the nation of Israel from Reuben. And Reuben was a son of Jacob. And because he had actually committed uh, uh, an immoral act, the father pushed him aside. And so the sons of Joseph became, the two sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, became the leaders of their own tribes. So all of this is going on in the Old Testament. And actually, when we come to the story, we see why the Ephraimites were very upset at Jephthah and at Gideon. Both Gideon and Jephthah, who were the judges in Israel again, both came from the tribe of Manasseh. All right? And so to understand this, go to 1 Chronicles chapter 5 uh, and hold your place there because we're going to come back to that. But in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, and verse 1, we read this. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was indeed the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that the genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. Now the sons of Joseph, to whom this birthright was given, taken from Reuben, was given to the two sons of Joseph were Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, when Jacob went to bless the sons of Joseph and assigned to them the head of the tribe, the half-tribe of Manasseh and half-tribe of, of Ephraim, when Jacob went to bless them, Remember, Joseph brings, I think it's in Genesis 48. Uh, you can go back and read that story. But they, they're brought before Jacob. And, and the father, Joseph, brings his two sons so that the father can bless them. And so when he brings them before uh, Jacob, he, he brings the older one, right, who is uh, uh, Manasseh, and the younger one is Ephraim. And so the older one, which is the firstborn, is going to get the blessing, the bigger blessing. And so he brings them, the older one, on the right hand of Jacob, and he brings Ephraim on the left side of Jacob. Well, when, when Jacob gets ready to bless them, guess what he does? He does this. He crosses his hands and puts his hand on the younger one, his right hand, which is the hand of blessing. He puts it on, the, on Ephraim, and on Manasseh, he puts the, the left hand. And so when the father, who, Joseph, he's, he's, he's on the ground, you know, before his father, and he looks up and he says, wait, 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 wait. And he tries to correct Jacob. He says, my, my father, my father. He says, you, you, you've got it wrong. And, and, you know, Jacob is old already. He says, my son, my son, I know, I know. <laughs> and so he tells him that the younger one is actually going to get the greater blessing. God did that. You remember with Jacob and Esau, he did that. Uh, and so here he blesses the younger one. He blesses Ephraim and he gets uh, to have the, the blessing, the bigger blessing, and then Manasseh. Now, what happens through the, through, the, through the time as they begin to grow up, that they become joint heads of, the of the tri one of the tribes of Israel. And Ephraim would get, obviously, the larger portion. So as their families grow and as their tribes begin to grow, rivalry begins to come among them. And resentment begins to rise up and burst forth between Ephraim and Manasseh. Go back to Judges uh, chapter, uh, let's see. Let's go to chapter 8 again. And in, in Judges chapter 8, we find that, again, the men of Ephraim come to Gideon and say, why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. And, of course, he answers them in a, in a kind of a, a nice way. And so they end up... Uh, you know, it says that their, his anger, their anger toward him subsided, the end of verse 3. 
So we have here Manasseh and Ephraim, two different tribes, both of them uh, half tribes, because again, they, they formed the 12th tribe, the 12th tribe of Israel. But, be, but throughout their, their growing up, throughout their generations, they begin to get these resentments towards each other because Manasseh had been overlooked for the greater blessing, and the younger brother Ephraim had gotten the majority of the blessing from the father. Now, in Judges chapter 12, continuing on in verse 4, it says, Now Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim. Remember, Jephthah is from Manasseh. He's from that tribe. And they fight against their brothers, Ephraim. And the men of Gilead defeated Ephraim because they said, You Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. And so that was kind of a, by the way, that was kind of an insult to them. You all are just like the, 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 the you know, the, the low lives, okay? Basically what they, what they meant. You're the fugitives of, of Ephraim and Manasseh. And so they uh, resented so much the, uh, that Jephthah was a judge there, and now he had, uh, you know, control over Israel because God had given him that. And so the Ephraimites resented this so much, again, that they even threatened him. Like I said, we will burn your house down, in verse 1. That death threat against Jephthah was real. But there was something else behind Ephraim's uh, resentment towards Manasseh. Not only were, was, it, was a death threat made, but there was also a hidden agenda behind their intimidation of Jephthah. Ephraim, the Ephraimites, wanted to regain the first place, the primacy over their brethren, the half-tribe of Manasseh. They had, uh, when the father blessed Ephraim over Manasseh, when God had given them that, Manasseh had risen up. Manasseh had, again, the judges, Gideon and Jephthah. And so they were resentful of that, that even though Jacob had blessed them, they were somehow not getting everything they thought they should have gotten. And so they, uh, throughout the, the, the development of the tribe, developed this hidden uh, agenda. We're going to do everything we can to bring Manasseh down, even though there were brothers, even though they uh, were heads of the, of the tribe, they were resentful that Manasseh was getting ahead. You know, there are times when we have to lovingly and clearly challenge sometimes those who come to us with arguments or hidden agendas or, you know, all kinds of objections. Uh, why? Because when people rise up with resentments, things that they haven't handled in their heart, and many times they rise up in the church, they rise up and with those resentments and hidden agendas, they take the peace of the people of God. They perturb the congregation. Part of our job as shepherds is to see that that doesn't happen. And any time that I see people with resentments in the body of Christ, I, I hone in on them. I try to help them because I know what resentment can do in the midst of God's people. It will destroy peace. It will destroy fellowship. It will destroy people's lives. Now, go to Jude, uh, excuse me, go to Judges uh, chapter 12. Go back there again. Now, the Ephraimites, as I said, had this hidden agenda. They, their resentment ultimately uh, erupted into violence. In verse 5, it says that they, they went out and they fought against the uh, Manassites. And the Gileadites seized the forts of the Jordan, it says, from before the Ephraimites, before they arrived. And when any Ephraimite who escaped said, let me cross over, the men of Gilead would say to him, are you an Ephraimite? And if they said no, then what? They would say to him, then say Shiboleth. And of course, they said Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. And then all of a sudden, because of this resentment that had uh, through generations been uh, um, Rising up in the Ephraimites, they eventually erupted into violence against their brothers and they suffered great losses, 42,000 men. And what happened as a result of this 
resentment that they had. It's a generational resentment. It went from one generation to another. It wasn't something I said that was just impulsively. They didn't just get angry at Jephthah because they weren't invited. There was something underneath the surface. And that resentment caused them and their tribe to be decimated. And not only was the, the tribe uh, of Ephraim a strong tribe, decimated of 42,000 warriors and men, the nation itself was weakened. Why? Because it began with angry words. It began with the brothers' resentments, or one of them anyway, towards the other. And the expressing of these long-held resentments broke out into violence against each other. And I think that this story kind of gives us a warning, all of us. We see divisions, as I said, in, in churches, in Christians, breaking fellowship with one another because of personal differences. And although they seem to happen suddenly, they really have been fueled by months and sometimes even years of resentments and jealousies and unforgiving attitudes, angry words and uh, things like that. And you know what? When people are angry and resentful, those angry words and those resentments have deep roots. Resentments turn into unforgiveness and unforgiving attitudes. And they generate conflict. And we see it in the tribe of Ephraim against their brothers. And again, when they came and said, hey, we wanted to help, but you didn't invite us. There was something deeper. There was something underneath. And we saw it as a result of how they treated those who were from the other tribe. They even threatened them. Remember I said, we're going to burn your house down. They were so angry. But it wasn't because they were not invited. It wasn't because they were not invited to fight in the battle. Because as we read there, they were told the battle is here. They just didn't show up. Because sometimes when people are resentful, have unforgiveness, they'll use anything and any opportunity to pour that unforgiveness out. They'll use anything to, 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 for that unforgiveness and angry words to rise up. And oftentimes, they don't even know why they're angry anymore in uh, the book of uh, Hebrews, go over there with me, chapter 12, verse 15, we read these words, look carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness, if I say bitterness, have you ever been bitter? You see, angry words and resentments have roots. And he says that a root of bitterness springing up, and it takes a while for that root of bitterness to take root, and that's why you should deal with resentments and unforgiveness and, and, and you know, things that have bothered you about what someone else did immediately. You shouldn't harbor them in your heart because the root of bitterness springs up, and it causes what? What does it cause? Trouble. I don't know anybody who likes trouble. I don't like trouble, do you? But it says that a root of bitterness will cause trouble. It caused it in Ephraim against the brothers in Manasseh. And he says that it'll, it'll spring up and cause trouble. And by this, that is by this bitterness, by these resentments, many, not just a few, but many become defiled. When a person has a root of bitterness in their heart and they've not dealt with it, and like the tribe of Ephraim, for generations, they just went on and on and on, and it just piled up and piled up until it broke off into full war, and they were the ones who lost 42,000 of their men killed because of their bitterness and their resentment. And it says, by this, many become defiled. Not only does it affect you, Resentment and unforgiveness and these things don't just affect you. You carry them, but they don't just affect you. They affect everybody else. And when, it, when you let it out, and sometimes people hold it on forever, and then at the last moment they bring it out, and it, and it hurts them, and it hurts those to, over whom they spread that resentment. I would encourage you tonight, if you're dealing with any kind of unforgiveness or resentment, that you deal with it before it becomes a bitter root that causes trouble, before it becomes a root that defiles you and defiles other people. Now, there are three New Testament uh, scriptures that 
and truths that deal with this issue that I want to leave with you tonight. I want you to go to James chapter 1. The first one is in James chapter 1, beginning at verse 19. Let's go there. Hebrews, excuse me, James chapter 1, verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, James says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man, or the anger of man, does not produce what? The righteousness of God. And here's one of the first important principles in dealing with this idea of resentment and anger. A man's anger, James says, does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. He says the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I don't care what, what kind of excuse you have for your anger, it will never produce righteousness. Notice that he says, so be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. It's interesting. Someone said God gave us two ears and one mouth because he wants us to hear twice as much as we speak. <laughs> All right? So be swift to hear, quick to listen, and slow to anger. Because the anger or the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You ought to line that in the Bible. The anger of man will never bring about a good result, the righteousness of God. Now, in Psalm 37, verse 8, we read this. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Stop. Let it go. Don't, do not fret. It only causes what? Harm. Cease from anger. Forsake your wrath. Whenever you find yourself in that situation, be alert. Be careful. Because the only thing that can come from that, the Scripture says, is harm. Again, a root of bitterness can spring up. It'll defile you and it'll defile those around you. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 9. It says, do not hasten in your spirit to be angry. Don't be in a hurry to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. All right, now anger is an emotion. We all have it. We, God has given us, you know, that ability to, fit, to sense and to feel that emotion. But we're not to be ruled by it. We're not to be given into it. So the anger, he says, rests in the bosom of fools. People are getting angry all the time about anything and everything. That's foolish. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 22. An angry man stirs up what? Strife. You see, what did the Ephraimites do when they came to Jephthah? They started stirring up what? Strife. You didn't call us. You didn't want us to have a part in this victory. You wanted this victory for yourself. And they started getting angry at him to the point where they said they were so angry, we we're going to burn your house down. They gave him a death threat because an angry man will always stir up strife. And a furious man, he says, abounds in transgression. I don't know anybody who has been angry and furious and could ever go out and do something beneficial because the result of that is harm. And he says, a man who's furious abounds in transgression. I mean, if you want to be a person who continually doing things that don't please God and are unrighteous, just be a person led by anger. And you will fulfill that pretty close. The second uh, truth that the New Testament gives us on how to deal with these, with these issues is found in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's go over there. Ephesians chapter 4. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26, it says, be angry and do not sin. Now, what does the Scripture say to be angry? I thought we were just talking about the fact we shouldn't be and we shouldn't, you know. No, you shouldn't allow yourself to be ruled by it. You shouldn't allow yourself to stay with anger. But anger is an emotion. It's like hunger. You know, when you get hungry, you're hungry. When you get angry, you're angry. You're, you're upset emotionally, right? I mean, that's part of your makeup. You can get angry. God made you and designed you that way. But he says, do not be, he says, be angry, but don't sin. Again, anger is an emotion. It's a response. 
But don't do something as a result of being angry that will displease God. And then he said, and here's the principle, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. What does that mean? Don't let the sun go down. In other words, don't let the, the day end. All right, when the sun goes down, the day ends, right? Don't let the day end before the day end, before you deal with your anger. Because oftentimes, and I know, I know this in myself as well, and everybody probably could, could testify of it. You know, when you've gotten angry about something and you're angry and you carry that anger and you refuse to deal with it and you refuse to forgive whoever it was that maybe did something that you didn't think was, was too cool and you get angry and you don't deal with it, then resentment comes in. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, that just goes on and on and you don't deal with it. You, you just let it go. And you see that person and you still feel that anger inside it, that resentment is a result of it. What happens is if you don't deal with the anger and the thing that caused that, it just continues to move on in your life. And pretty soon, a year down the road, you know, you might see that person again, and you, or, or you might not even see that person anymore. But the same situation that brought you there happens again, and you're angry again. And all of a sudden, you're doing things as a result of your anger that now you don't even know why you're doing them. You're just angry. People ask you, why are you angry? I don't know, <laughs> you know. I mean, I've known people like that. Have you known people like that? I mean, they, they don't even know why they're angry. They're just angry about everything. And the reason is because they didn't deal with their anger. They buried it. And if you bury anger, it'll stay there. And then it'll break out later. It might be years down the road. It'll break out, and you're an angry person, and, and you, I don't know why I'm angry. I'm just angry. Everything bothers me, you know. <laughs> because you didn't deal with that. And that's why the wisdom of the Scripture is when you are angry. Be angry, but don't sin. And don't let the sun go down on your wrath and your anger. Deal with it, because if you let it go too long, you're going to forget why you got angry, but the anger will still be there. And oftentimes it turns into resentment, and you resent things and people and events and happenings, and you don't even remember why. What a sad condition to live under, isn't it? To be an angry person, you don't even know why you're angry anymore. Because that sin wasn't dealt with the way God said to do it. And so this is a very good practice. When you're angry about something and with someone, refuse for the day to end before you deal with it. And I've had people to be angry with me. And, you know, uh, they'll come out and they say, well, this happened, this happened. I say, well, wait a minute. That happened a long time ago. Yeah, I know, but I have it, you know, I remember. It's like, well, why didn't you tell me? You know, I apologize to people whenever I've hurt them. You should too. But to, to go months and maybe sometimes even years and then something bad happens in your relationship and then they dump that on you? That's what the Bible talks about, being defiled. You defile yourself. You walk through all that time defiled because you didn't deal with it. And so all of a sudden, you know, something happens and you bring all this arsenal out, all this stuff you got in your heart and you start throwing it all in. As a matter of fact, when, when someone uh, does something to you and hurts you and wounds you, and, and yeah, maybe, maybe you feel it, you sense it, but it ought, ought not be, you know, that you have still things there that, against them that you haven't dealt with. Because again, you defile yourself and you defile others. And plus, it's a disobedience to God. If you walk with resentments for months and years, and then you dump them out later on that person, You've been disobedient all that time to the Lord. Think about it. And sometimes you can go back and you can say, well, things weren't working out quite right for me. And the Lord will remind you, that's why. Now you've got to repent of it. That's why. Why isn't it working out? And the Lord said, that's why. And I know, you know, all of us have a tendency to do that. But we ought not to. We ought to listen to what the Scripture says. You're angry. Yes, I'm angry. But I need to deal with this anger, Lord. I need, to, I need to forgive this person. I need to release them. I need to not allow this to become a contaminating element in my heart. Can you say amen? So undealt anger leads to resentment and bitterness. And here in verse 27, we're told that it even gives a place to who? To the devil. He says, be angry and sin not. 
Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, and nor give place to the devil. Because the devil would like nothing better than to keep you in resentment, to keep you in, in bitterness, keep you in unforgiveness. Because if he can do that, he can destroy your life. And so don't give the devil any place. Tell him, no, I'm not. Yeah, what they did was terrible, and that, but Lord, I'm going to deal with this. I refuse to continue to be angry. You know, one of the things I appreciate my, about my wife is that, you know, whenever we, we have a disagreement, she always wants to handle it, you know, right away. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit different. I, I want to, you know, stew a little bit, you know. <laughs> Maybe you're like that, you know. I, I just still my flesh kind of, you know, she says, you know, let's talk about it. No, I don't want to talk about it. Let, you know, and she'll come to me and she'll say, you know, let, I don't, I don't want to go. I can't go to sleep if we're, we're you know. And, uh, and so she, she wants to, you know, to deal with the anger or the thing that got us to that point immediately. And so that ought to be something that we do, all of us. And I know sometimes your flesh wants to get the better of you and you want to, you know, stew a little bit more. But all it does, all it does is it opens the door for the enemy. All it does opens the door for the devil. I remember years ago, uh, my, my older son, he's about 37, 38 now. His, his mom died when he was 10 or so. But uh, I remember his mom and I, we were having a disagreement. We'd just come back from church even. Think about that. You ever done that? Go home from church and you're in an argument? It's like, what's up with that? You know, we were with, we were with this argument. And, I mean, she was telling me and I was telling her. And we were raising our voice and we got home and we got into our, our house and you know, opened the door for my dog to go out and do his business. And, and so we're arguing and doors open. All of a sudden, I hear my dog scream. You know, and I, but we both look at each other and, op- and I, we look at the door and I had opened the door to the front. I never let him out the front. I always let him out to the back. But because we were arguing and fighting, it just, I opened the door and ran out, and got run over by a car and killed. So I run out the door. We both run out the door in the middle of the street. And here's my dog, you know, with his little head over, bleeding from the mouth, just kind of looking at me. And my wife and I looked at each other and we just kind of picked it up and brought him inside, but the dog died. And I remember clear as day, the Lord said to me, that could have been one of your children. Because see, when you're angry, you do things and you don't even think about it. The enemy blinds you with your rage and anger so much that you do things that in your right mind you wouldn't do. I wouldn't have opened the door and let my dog out into the front. That wasn't what I did. I let him out the back. But I didn't think. And the Lord really admonished me that night, my wife and I, and we had to ask for each other for forgiveness and pray, you know, but we lost the dog, but it could have been a child. So don't ever think that, well, those things don't have consequences. They do. The devil would like nothing better than to blind you by resentment and unforgiveness because he can take advantage of you. So handle it, deal with it, and don't give the devil, Paul says, any place. The third principle that's important here, first one is the anger of man doesn't uh, produce the righteousness of God. Uh, The second one is that uh, we ought to deal with our anger or not to give the devil a place. And then in James chapter 3 and verse 14 through 16, we read this, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. See, we read the story of Ephraim, the Ephraimites, right? They were bitter against their brothers, right? They envied them. And because they were getting along better, even though God had promised them a greater blessing, they were self-seeking. He says, if you're bitter and envious and self-seeking in your heart, if you're always looking out for you, if you envy what others have, and you're bitter against them because maybe they're doing better than you are. You think you deserve better. You become self-seeking. Everything you do is for you. He said, if you do that, you're lying against the truth. Verse 15. He says, this wisdom, the envy and the bitterness, it doesn't descend from above. It doesn't come from God. God doesn't send you that. He says, but it's earthly. It's sensual. It's demonic. If I say demonic. See, the devil's involved. Demons are involved. Verse 16. For where envy and self-serving or self-seeking exist, wherever there's envy, wherever there's selfish ambition or self-seeking, there is what? Confusion and every evil thing. 
You see, whenever the enemy gets involved and we allow our bitterness and our resentment and our unforgiveness and envy and self-seeking, all we produce is not righteousness but confusion and every evil thing. You see, when the Ephraimites, right, through their resentments of generations, right, against their brothers, finally broke out in the, the war and in, and in their uh, violence, they lost. They lost. They were confused. And as James says here, there is every evil thing. There was disorder. There was evil. So we need to be careful as we look at the Scripture for wisdom and for insight, Lord, that when we are uh, resentful, when we have unforgiveness, when we are moved to anger, that we deal with these issues the way God tells us to, to not allow them to fester and to become roots of bitterness. It can happen to the best of people. In Acts chapter 15, we read a story about the Apostle Paul. Let's go over there. And uh, Barnabas, they're out preaching the gospel. They're out to doing the work of God. And in Acts chapter 15 and verse 36, Acts 15, beginning in verse 36, it says, Then after some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where the, we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. In other words, let's go and get, it, get back to the task of, you know, of overseeing the churches where we've, we've preached the gospel. And it says, now Barnabas was determined to take with him John, called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. In Acts chapter 13, verse 13, you find that, uh, that said that, that when they got to this particular city of Pamphylia, John didn't want to go out. John Mark didn't want to. He's a, he was a younger man at the time. He didn't, he didn't want to go anymore. He decided, you know, no, I, I don't know why. The Scripture doesn't tell us. It just says, you know, that he decided he was going to go back. He wasn't going to continue on in the work of the ministry. He was going to go back to Jerusalem. And so this made Paul angry. And Paul insisted. They, they, Barnabas said, hey, we could take John Mark. And Paul said, no, we're not going to take him. He, he, he abandoned us when we were out, remember, uh, we were at Pamphylia. He left. He didn't want to go. I mean, I don't know. Paul probably thought, yeah, John Mark's a wimp, man. We don't want him around. I, I, we're, we're, I'm not going to take him. And so Barnabas said, no, we're going to take him. Paul said, no, we're not going to take him. Yes, we are. No, we're not. And then it says there in verse uh, 38, excuse me, 39, that the contention became so sharp, so heated that they parted from one another. I said, it happens to who? To the best of us, right? I mean, here are two, two guys, two apostles. They're doing the work of God. And then they get this idea, this great, let's go and visit the church. That's a good plan. Let's go and back and, and, and let's go and serve the Lord and go and, and oversee the works that, that we have uh, preached in these cities. Uh, uh, let's take Mark with us. Who? Mark. No, we're not taking that guy. And Peter, or excuse me, and Paul and Barnabas, who were so close doing the work together, split apart. Because one of them, Paul, said we are not taking him because he abandoned us when we were there in Pamphylia. And so they broke off. They split. They each went their own way. Paul had uh, decided that he was, going, he was not going to take John Mark. And so he broke up with Barnabas and they both went in their own direction. So as you read that story, you wonder, well, Paul was an apostle. I mean, he got, and the, the, the word there that the contention became so sharp. Actually, it says that it was a heated, very heated discussion that they actually said, or I'm not going to do that. And Barnabas said, well, I'm not going to leave John. I'm going to take him with it. Well, then you go on and, you know, <laughs> you go on your way and I'll go my way. And they parted. And so as we look at that, we think, well, who was right? I mean, was Paul right or was Barnabas right? Well, I tend to think that Barnabas was right. That Paul actually preferred not to take John Mark. This wasn't an issue of doctrine. It wasn't an issue of, you know, whether they were compromising the truth. It was just that Paul preferred not to take him. He decided, you know, no, we gave him an opportunity and he failed and, and I'm not going to take him. It's interesting because later, years later, Paul 
writing, uh, I think it was to Timothy, he said, oh, by the way, bring John Mark with you because he's useful to me for the ministry. <laughs> Uh, so the guy that he didn't want there at the end now he calls and, and calls for him to come and to help him so evidently that relationship was fixed but what I want you to see is that even the apostles they went through this they uh, parted from one another and one took why because of personal preferences now it's one thing to divide over things that matter and I will talk to you real quick about that because there are times when Division or separation is called for, but not for preferences, not for personalities, not for likes and dislikes. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. Paul writes to the Corinthian church and he, because he has heard that there's divisions in the body. And uh, in verse 10, he says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, this is the guy, remember, who had had a division, right, with Barnabas. And now he's writing to the church. Obviously, he learned years later that maybe perhaps that division that he had uh, broken off from his brother Barnabas, it was fixed ultimately, and he had to deal with that just like you and I do. Now he writes to the Corinthian church and he says, I want you to be perfectly joined together that there be no divisions. For it has been declared to me, verse 11, concerning you, my brethren, that those of, by those of Chloe's household that there are contentions among you. That's the same word. That's, that's over there in Acts. He, was, he had a contention with Barnabas. And it says here, now I say this, that each of you say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Does anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. You see, there was these divisions in Corinth, and the root of the divisions here in Corinth were personalities, preferences, right? I prefer Paul. I prefer, you know, Peter. That I prefer, you know, Apollos. They each had their own favorite preachers. All right? I, I'd rather hear so-and-so. I, 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 I enjoy better, you know, hearing so-and-so. I like this person better. And so there was, uh, I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with that unless you use that to cause division in the body. Right? And so they were following men. And so Paul says, hey, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in my name? Right? He's, he would go ahead and say, we're just servants of Christ. Why are you using these personal preferences, the things, to bring division into the body of Christ? And we ought never to bring division based on our personal preferences. Well, you know what? I don't like the, seat, the way the seats are arranged in this church, or I'm going to go somewhere else, or I'm going I'm to start telling people, you know, I don't like this. And sometimes you'll hear people uh, express preferences. And again, there's nothing wrong with that unless that becomes a point that they use to try to bring division to the church. Then, if you're a wise person, if you're a mature person, you would take that person aside and say, listen, it's okay to have the preference. Just don't make this an issue among the people. Because if you do, the pastors are going to say something, are going to have something to say about that. Because oftentimes, you know, we think that things ought to be done the way we would rather they are done. Remember, Jacob's going to bless the, the children and he does this. Well, why did he do that? Why did he bless? He, blows, he blessed the wrong person. He should have blessed Manasseh, and he ended up giving the greater blessing to Ephraim. What's up with that? And all of a sudden, again, because there was a preference, right? And it's interesting because God was in that. And oftentimes we think, you know, God's only in what we think. 
God couldn't be in what, you know, somebody else thinks. God surely couldn't be in what, you know, my brother uh, is doing. He's in what I'm doing, right? <laughs> and so we need to be careful that we don't allow those things to become issues of division within the body of Christ. Personalities, preferences, likes, and dislikes. And by the way, unity in the body ought always to be based on the truth. If I say truth. And here's what I, what, what I meant when I said that there are some times when there are things that have to be separated. Because unity is not unity for unity's sake. Unity in the body is always based on the truth of God. And sometimes there are opportunities and there are times when there have to be confrontation. Like Jephthah with the tribe of Ephraim. And he said, you know, hey, the Lord gave us victory. Why are you coming here now and attacking me? Why, wh what is this attitude? What's going on? Right? Now, sometimes those types of confrontations are unavoidable. And sometimes they're even necessary. Uh, when the principles of the truth of the gospel and the truth of God are violated. Let me give you an example. In Galatians chapter 2, we find the Apostle Paul writing about his experience, right, within the gospel and with the brethren in Christ and in the church. And he says this, that when Peter had come to Antioch, what does he say? I withstood him to his face. In other words, I got up in his face, right? Why? Because there was something he was to be blamed for. There was something wrong, all right? The truth of the gospel was being compromised. He was to be blamed. Verse uh, 12, he says, For before certain men came from James, remember James was the, the head apostle in the church of Jerusalem. He was the, the leader, the senior leader there in the church among the apostles. And so James would send the other men to, uh, to the other churches, right, to go and check out how they were doing. And he says that when James sent certain men uh, to Antioch, uh, well, Peter would separate himself. He would eat with the Gentiles. Remember, Jews couldn't get along with Gentiles or, or wouldn't associate with Gentiles. But when the gospel came, right, God opened the door to everybody, Jews and Gentiles. But it was just kind of beginning. And so Peter, uh, still kind of with the Jewish mentality, he would eat with the Gentiles because he knew the gospel. God had accepted them just like he accepted us. But when James sent the men from Jerusalem and they came, what did Peter do? He withdrew. He separated himself from his Gentile brothers. Why? Because of fear. It's religious fear. He feared those who were of the circumcision or those who were of Jewish right, uh, descent that had been sent by James. Verse 13, it says, And the rest of the Jews also played what? The hypocrite with him. So what was Paul saying? What was Peter's sin? Hypocrisy. He says, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. You see how sin all of a sudden began to infect not just Peter, but everybody else. Barnabas and everybody else. He said, you know what? They're coming from James. They're going to send him and we better not be around the Gentiles because you know how they are and, and we don't just, you know, we don't want them to, to come down on us. And so they would separate from the Gentile believers. And Peter, or excuse me, Paul saw this and he got up in the face of Peter and said, what are you doing? What are you doing? Verse 14. He said, when I saw that they were not straightforward about the, the what? The truth. You see, here's the reason for confrontation. They're not walking according to the truth. They're not shooting straight, if you would. He said, when, that, when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews. Remember, the Jews didn't get, they, did, they didn't associate with Gentiles. But Peter was. Now they had come into the Christ, and they were accepted by God, and he knew that. He said, if you being a Jew live with, as of the manner of the Gentiles, you live with them, you, 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 know, you have contact with them, and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? And he, he, he brought the truth of the gospel, and he said, Christ has accepted the Gentiles just like he's accepted us. Now why are you withdrawing from them just because you're afraid of what they're going to think about you? 
And so he confronted him. Why? Because the truth was being violated. And any time the truth is violated, there is an opportunity, listen, for false teaching, for false uh, uh, behaviors to become accepted. And we can't do that, Paul was saying. We can't allow that because we are teaching the gospel. How can we teach one thing and live something else? So he confronted him because unity is always based on the truth of the Word of God. And like I said, sometimes it's unavoidable. Confrontation has to come. So standing for the truth sometimes will bring division because the truth divides. Say that out loud. The truth divides. You believe that? See, there are people that think we ought to have unity at all costs. That's not biblical. You know, we, should, we just shouldn't talk about things that cause division. Truth always divides. Truth always divides against error because truth doesn't welcome error. Come on. Now, look at what Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 34. Jesus said, and sometimes people don't, you know, some of people, people tell me, well, you know what? We, we just shouldn't worry so much about that. And we should just, we should just get along. We should just love everybody. And, and you know, just try to do everything we can to, to maintain the peace. And I say, yes, except compromise the truth. Jesus said this, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. What does that mean? I thought he was the prince of peace. I thought, you know, when the angels made the announcement, you know, peace on earth, goodwill toward man, Jesus is coming, right? What did Jesus come and say? I, don't, I didn't come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Keep going. Verse 35. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Jesus, what are you doing? We should just all get along. Why, why would you want to set a man against his father? What does that mean? A daughter against her mother. I mean, if you just read that scripture, you think, well, Jesus didn't, well, we shouldn't follow Jesus if that's what he wants to do. Most liberal people today would say, well, that's terrible. Why would a man, why would a person set a man against his father? Why would you want to set someone against their father? But here's what you got to understand. Jesus is talking about the truth. He came to bring the truth. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God is the truth. And when the truth comes, error doesn't like it. So when Jesus brings the truth to a man and his father does not accept it, guess what? That man is going to be against his father. Remember when you first came to Christ, maybe your family, they weren't Christians, and, and you came to Christ, and they thought you were nuts, and you were brainwashed, and what are you doing? And all of a sudden, you had trouble with your family because you were going to church, because you were reading the Bible. What's wrong with you? We never taught you that. Are you some kind of a fanatic? And all of a sudden, even though you didn't want to, now you have a conflict because the truth always brings conflict against error. And that's what Jesus is talking about. I didn't come to bring peace. The truth brings a sword. It divides. And then in verse 36, he says this, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. I've known people that came to Christ and everybody in their family ostracized them. And for all intents and purposes, they were the enemy. Jesus said, a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves his father and mother more than he loves me, what did he say? He's not worthy of me. And he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In other words, if you're going to follow me, I am the truth. If you're going to follow me, that might set you against your father. You're going to follow me, that might set you against your mother. Are you willing to do that? If you're going to follow me, and you love your father more than me, you're not worthy of me. If you're going to cave in, well, okay, I guess I'll do what daddy wants, even though it's not what Jesus wants. Okay, I guess I'll do what mama wants because, you know, after all, it's mama. And, you know, yeah, I guess I'll, I, I can't do what Jesus wants me to do because mama doesn't want me to. That's what Jesus is talking about. The enemies will be of, the, of your own household. Those will try to talk you out of following after me. Verse 38 and he who does not take up his cross and follow me after me is not 
worthy of me. In other words, you've got to die to yourself. Because the cross was the implement where people were executed. Verse 39. And he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. What a tremendous truth, right? But Jesus said, I came to bring the truth into a household. And that truth will always bring division. Jesus brings division by bringing the truth, by bringing the sword. Now, in closing, what can break the roots of division? We talk about that based on division based on anger or resentment or bitterness or personalities or personal preferences. Well, Paul gave an instruction in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, go over there, that I think we need to keep in mind. The thing that can diffuse divisions, divisions of anger and resentment and bitterness and personalities that we talked about and preferences is agape love. Everybody say love. Agape love is God's love. Agape love can diffuse divisions that are based on these things, not always based on the truth because those will come, but divisions that are based on anger or resentments in people's lives. How can we break those roots of division? By loving people. In 1 Corinthians 13, 1, Paul said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, agape, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but I have not love. I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. In other words, if I do all these things, but I don't do it out of love for God or love for others, he said, it profits me nothing. And then he defines what love is. And love is not a feeling. Love is an action. And he describes these actions here, beginning at verse 4. Love, agape love, suffers long. It's long suffering. And sometimes you do have to put up with people. And you do have to put up with the way they are. Because you understand that God loved you. And he expects you to love others as well. By the way, when Peter, or excuse me, when Paul broke away from, from Barnabas, you know what brought him back? This is what brought him back. It was love. It was love finally for recognizing that, you know what, I might have overreacted. Yeah, I didn't want John Mark to come. Yeah, I preferred that he didn't. He was just, I just saw him as a hindrance and, you know, had to put up with his stuff. And, and it's just I didn't personally like that. And I'm sure that Paul had to come to grips with that and say, you know what? But God loves him. And I need to love him. And I need to, you know, be long-suffering to, towards him. And what else? Love does not envy. It's not envious. Love does not parade itself. Love doesn't go off, hey, everybody, look at me. Love is not puffed up. Doesn't lift itself up. Because he recognizes everything I am, I am by the grace of God. If I am anything and if I'm worth anything, it's only because of God and what he's done for me. And so love doesn't behave rudely. Boy, I tell you, if most of us would heed that, just that part of verse 5, just don't be rude. Just don't be rude to people. I remember one time I snapped at somebody and my wife corrected me. She says, don't be rude. <laughs> and I realized, you know, wow, my wife's close, you know, closest person to me. And she noticed that I wonder what everybody else saw. Don't be rude. Love isn't rude. Love does not what? Seek its own. You seek the benefit of others, to help others. I know that oftentimes we think, well, if I seek, you know, the benefit of others first, everybody's going to take advantage of me. Everybody's going to walk all over me. But listen, you're not wiser than God. And God tells you to do that. And he tells you to do that because he knows something maybe that you and I don't know yet. That love, when you love people, 
when you stop seeking for yourself and you start doing for others, you know what God does? It delights God's heart. You know what God does? He exalts you. This is love. It's not provoked. I know the King James says love is not easily provoked. The word easily is kind of uh, in italics, it's kind of, it was kind of uh, added in there by the translators. I think because they, they, they couldn't come to, uh, to really believe that it's not, pro- love does, it's not provoked. Well, it's not easily provoked. No, it's not provoked. If you love God, you love others, he says you're not going to be provoked. It doesn't mean you're not going to hurt. It doesn't not mean that you're not going to, you know, feel anger rise inside of you. But you're not allowing yourself to be provoked. Because you understand God's love. And it says, and he thinks no evil. That means you don't keep a record. Huh, you did that to me, huh? All right. I might not do, nothing, do anything now, but I won't write it down. Huh? It doesn't keep an account. It doesn't keep track of what others have done. You know what? When you refuse to keep track of, of other people's evils against you, you won't ever, ever fall into resentment. I know it's easier said than done, but when you meditate in the Word of God and realize, Lord, this is really the path, isn't it? The path of love. That I'm not going to allow that to provoke me. I'm not going to think evil. I'm not going to keep, keep an account of those who have harmed me. Help me, Lord, to do that. And then finally, in verse uh, 6, he says, It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in what? In the truth. Now, you might not find something to rejoice about when you're wanting to love people who are unlovable or unlovely. And you might not uh, rejoice in what they're doing, but you can rejoice in the truth. And the truth is, Lord, that they need you more than they recognize and so I'm just, I'm just refused to be provoked. I'm just going to love them. And then he says, love believes all things, bears all things. It's long-suffering. It believes all things. It hopes all things and endures all things. In other words, it trusts God in everything that it bears and it believes and it hopes. Because ultimately, our trust and our faith is in the Lord. Can you say amen? And then he says this in verse 8, love never fails. Love never fails. And if you could grasp that about the agape love of God and you, you begin to step out, sometimes the enemy will try to tell you, well, you're going to lose if you do that. People are going to think, or take advantage of you, going to think you're crazy. But you know what? Love never fails. You can't fail by loving people. You can't fail by not being, by not being rude to them. You, you can't fail by doing that because God is in your corner. And if God is in your corner, you're a majority. You don't need everybody else to be in your corner. You just need God to be with you. Amen? And love becomes actually that which can diffuse divisions that are based on anger and resentment and bitterness and personalities, as we read over in Corinthians, and personal preferences. I wonder if maybe you're facing some kind of tension or division or resentments tonight that are based on maybe personalities or preferences or things, uh, you know, that maybe have brought anger into your life. Maybe you're holding on to resentments or unforgiveness. You've not dealt with them. Maybe you realize tonight that you've just given the place an enemy or or, or the enemy a place and you don't want to do that because you don't want to defile yourself or defile others. But I call upon you in the name of the Lord tonight to let go of them. I don't know if you're here or maybe you're watching us online and those resentments have really made your life miserable and you're at a point right now where you say, I need to let go. I need to ask God for forgiveness, and I need to trust in his love. Would you pray tonight with me? Would you bow your head? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the love that you have given us in Christ. Your word says that you have poured your love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We don't have to get love. We already have it. 
It abides in our heart because the Holy Spirit is in our life. I pray, Lord, that anyone here tonight that is harbored resentment, unforgiveness, and Lord, as they heard tonight the message, maybe someone came into their mind and they're reminded, I have that against that person. May they call out their name to you right now and say, Lord, just like you have forgiven me, I choose to forgive them. And I release them, Lord. I ask you to forgive me for bitterness, any bitterness, any unforgiveness in my heart, any lack of forgiveness that I have towards them or towards anyone. And right now, tonight, Lord, I let it go. I drop it, Lord. And I thank you because you have forgiven me more than anyone has ever done to me. My sin has offended you greatly. And I ask your forgiveness. And Father, I pray that this love, this agape love that you've given to us, had the ability to forgive others, is what will bring healing. It's what will bring unity. It's what will bring freedom from resentment and a root of bitterness. And so, Father, I thank you tonight for healing hearts, for healing bitterness, and for healing resentments out of people's hearts, and that they may break forth into a newness of living and a newness of life that only the Holy Spirit can bring. Thank you, Lord. And may we meditate this week on this chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, that love of what love is. And Lord, as we see our life and we see something missing, may we say, Holy Spirit, you by your power, empower me, Lord, to live this love out in my life and towards others. I pray that, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. And I give you praise and glory for it. Amen. And a